Hello, welcome to Xenosis with Joy. I'm Joy, and today we're going to be talking about breed-specific legislation, why it doesn't work, why it exists, and alternatives to breed-specific legislation. I'm sure we're going to pick a lot of fights in the comments, so start that below, get some more engagement. Yeah, I'd love to hear from you. So first of all, what is breed-specific legislation? Um, you probably have heard it in the news recently. The UK government, um, under the Conservative Party, has proposed to add the so-called XL Bully, the American XL Bully, the American Bully XL, it's a very inconsistent naming, um, to the list of banned breeds. Now in the UK they have a Dangerous Dogs Act, which came into effect in 1991. Keep that date in mind for later, by the way. Um, and it has a number of different breeds, I think four so far, that have um, been supposedly bred for fighting, in the words of the um, legislators and legislation. And the idea with this is that basically we'll breed these breeds out of existence in the UK. So um, this would include um, having all XL bullies neutered and uh, banning the sale, banning the breeding and banning the gifting of these dogs. And the remaining dogs need to be kept on a leash and a muzzle in public at all times. Now, this is a pretty restrictive law, as you can imagine. It's very um, infringes a lot of people's personal property rights to, you know, do with their animal what they please. Um, so as you can imagine, it's facing a lot of public scrutiny. But I want to ask the question, um, is this sort of legislation founded in any actual science? What does the science say? And why are people pushing these sort of legislations? And the answer may be a little bit different than what you think. So first of all, are some breeds more inherently aggressive or dangerous than other breeds? And the short answer to that is no, or not as far as we can tell. Um, if you compare the, uh, a, there was a study back in 2008 that compared the incidence of um, inappropriate aggression and uh, inappropriate aggressive behaviors in targeted breeds, so Dobermans, um, Pit Bulls, Staffordshire Charriers, Staffordshire Bull Terrier, Bull Terriers, um, that kind of thing, versus some of the most um, stereotypically friendly, uh, non-aggressive dog. Uh, the Golden Retriever, and they found that there was no statistical difference between these two breeds in terms of inappropriate aggression. It was about 5% of the targeted breeds and about 3% of the Golden Retriever. So I don't know if you've ever met a Golden Retriever before. Anecdotally, they're extremely friendly dogs, but I have dealt with aggressive ones, and they're a vast minority of the population, just like the supposed targeted breeds. Okay, so there's that. Um, but what about Looking at incidents of dog bites, are certain breeds overrepresented? Sure. But if you look at the statistics, it doesn't really flesh out that the supposedly dangerous breeds are the ones that are more likely to bite. In fact, a Dutch study a couple years later, I think it was around 2010 or so, uh, I'll have the links of the sources in the description, so if you read them, please do. Um, but it found that the most common dog breeds that bite people are the most common dogs. <laughs> About 10% of the do dog bite incidents are related to Jack Russell Terriers, which are about yay big. Um, so really, it's nothing to do with specific dangerous breeds, it's just that certain dogs are more predisposed to being, having, in a, uh, you know, not really anything to do with predisposing aggression, it's just that some dogs are more prone to it than other dogs on an individual level. Okay, so you say, maybe that's true, maybe the science just hasn't caught up to it, maybe we just haven't established that you know, certain dogs are more dangerous, but could this legislation theoretically work? Well. No, there's no evidence for this. There's no evidence that it has produced or um, tried to, you know, on its own will work to reduce or eliminate bite incidences or hospitalization due to bite injuries. Now, if you look at the statistics there's and, you know, case reports, um, there was the case of Winnipeg, which I think is probably one of the most, that lends the most support to this, this idea that banning pit bulls led to a reduction in dog bites. However, this also, corresponds to the exact same time that they put money into public education programs to encourage responsible dog ownership and bite awareness and that kind of thing. So yeah, I, I don't think there's any strong evidence out there. I cited a number of studies that looked into this issue and there's not really anything that really suggests that um, banning specific breeds has any effect on bite incidents. Now, the problem with this legis type of legislation is first of all, identifying which dogs you're targeting. What exactly is a pit bull? It's not a breed, it's a confirmation, right? You got Staffordshire Bull Terriers, um, you have American Bull Terriers, you have Bulldogs, you have 
the American XL bully, like this is a made up category. This is a confirmation, a shape, a shape of dog. And trying to identify which dogs fall into the shape is a matter of opinion. It's not a matter of science. It's not a matter of any kind of expert opinion. They've actually showed that experts are not very good at identifying specific dog breeds visually. And uh, they've, you know, the people making these visual identifications are not experts. They're not veterinarians. They're not dog breed experts. They are police officers. And police officers famously are undertrained in everything. So, you know, I don't think that's a very good argument right off the bat. Um, other part of it is that if these aren't specific breeds, you're not really breeding in traits, it's just the shape of the animal. Um, so breeding for aggression, I mean, you're not even breeding for anything, we're just looking at a shape of an animal. Um, so suppose you do successfully ban a specific breed of dog. Well, what are people gonna do? And time and time again, they just pick a new breed of dog. They just breed a new type of dog. Um, that fulfills the same exact role. And what is that role? Well, I mean, obviously, if we're thinking about uh, pit bulls in the United States have traditionally been linked to dog fighting, right? So this isn't so much an issue of dangerous breeds, but dangerous socialization practices. You have animals that are poorly socialized, that are bred, uh, you know, that are trained to be aggressive and are used as attack dogs or fighting dogs. And then these animals are, you know, in the population. So it's not so much an issue of dangerous breeds or dangerous genetics. It's about dangerous training tactics. But why do we have this kind of cultural milieu, this cultural panic about dangerous breeds and this push for breed specific legislation? It comes down to some very surprising things. And I actually was quite shocked when I read into it a bit more, but you could trace this roots back to the 1980s. Um, now, in the United States, um, as you can imagine, they abolished uh, legal de jure racial segregation in the 60s. However, there is still de facto racial segregation going on in the United States. And one of the legislations that has been put in place to combat this is called the Fair Housing Act. In the United States in the 80s, this is where we start seeing breed-specific legislation. And this is kind of the same time that we get the uh, Fair Housing Act coming into force and trying to integrate communities in the United States. Now, there's a zeitgeist at this point in time when we think about you know, Ronald Reagan and the 80s and the sphere of black urban crime. And there was a belief that certain types of people were breeding certain types of dogs that were more prone to attacking, hurting, or even killing people. And the people that were primarily targeted were black Americans living in the city. And the kind of dogs that they were stereotypically associated to have were the breeds that were first targeted, pit bulls, right? So it's this idea that they have these dangerous dogs that they're training them to, for gang activities and for dog fighting and for illicit crime activities. And by breeding, banning these, we could, you know, stop crime, you know? Um, but there's also an aspect to this that this is a de facto form of racial segregation. The idea that if you're banning certain types of dogs, that means certain types of people can't move into your neighborhood or into your city. So these kind of breed specific bans were being used in America to carry on the tradition of racial segregation into the 20th and 21st century. Um, and it's very shocking that it also got started in the UK right after this period of you know, Reaganism and Thatcherism um, in 1991. So I think there is a, there's a case to be made and I, I'm gonna post the abstract of the paper here and the link is in, uh, you know, the, the actual paper um, citation is in the description, but I encourage you to read it for yourself that I think there's a very strong link here between proponents of racial segregation and breed specific legislation. So uh, that aside, so this is ineffective bad policy and I think it unfairly targets certain demographics of people we could do better. You know, I'm in favor of legislation that will reduce or eliminate dog bites and dog attacks. Some of the things that have been proposed, I mean, public education may be one of the best ways of doing it. And, you know, educating people about dog socialization and um, about bite awareness and how to address these behaviors in young puppies and how to get through those uh, difficult developmental stages in puppies. It's very effective that way. Also having publicly funded spay neuter clinics or, you know, at cost or free for people to spay or neuter their animals so that they're, you know, they can have a stable population and they can spend time and they can take care of the animals that they currently have. You know, there's also an argument to be made that we should be cracking down on 
dogfighting rings, and we should be cracking down on people who um, are using these animals and breeding them specifically for fighting, rather than targeting individuals who own an animal that just matches a magical confirmation that makes the amygdala go woo and triggers some sort of moral panic for busybodies uh, living in white gated communities with their golden retrievers that bite a five-year-old and you know cause all these issues, right? So you have to think about it. This is not a scientific issue. This is about fear, anxiety, and a, primarily a white anxiety, I would argue, and it's related to keeping the tradition of segregation alive. It has nothing to do with the dogs themselves, it has no scientific basis for these breed specific legislations, and if you're in favor of them, you know, I don't think this video is going to convince you. Even if you read the things in the description, you're just going to find something else to justify your beliefs. So this video is really for people who are on the fence or don't really know much about the issue and can come to their own conclusions by reading the evidence and doing the research. So I, I don't want you to go to dogbites.org and, and see whatever propaganda they're pushing your way. I want you to actually sit down, critically read the papers, come to your own evidence, come to your own conclusions, but also bear in mind that these legislations that have no evidence and that they have a very tainted reputation. So that's all I had for today. It's a very short, angry rant. Um, with some evidence and some scientific backing, but I hope you enjoyed and if you have if you want to fight me in the comments It's down in the section below and that's really all I have for today. I'm um, sorry for the hiatus um, But uh, I'll keep posting as much as I can. Peace